Um, welcome to History Matters and so does a warm beverage that doesn't happen to be coffee today because I didn't <laughs> have to make it, but still has a little zing. Um, today, as uh, advertised a little earlier than I have in the recent past, which makes me very proud because of Matt, because Matt said I needed to get this in on time and I did. Um, we're going to be talking about bullying as politics, which we've done, I think, a little over a year ago. Um, but so much has happened since then, and it seems to be something we really need to talk about now. So that's the topic for today. But before we plunge in to the topic, I am going to turn to my partner in crime, Matt, who is going to explain the rules of the game. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. This is a fantastic evening. I'm getting like fog on my glasses. That's how excited I am about this. So let me take <laughs> those off. Uh, welcome. We encourage you to use chat. Uh, please put in all the comments, all the links, all the fun stuff. We enjoy your conversation. Um, and uh, and uh, as always, if you um, do put something in there, try to keep it germane to the conversation. And of course, family friendly. Um, if you do have questions for Joanne, we encourage, question lot, qu we encourage questions, lots of questions. So many questions, in fact, that I can't get to them all. So please put in questions because this is, what really drives the show is your questions, not mine. So please put those in in the Q&A. If that's at the bottom of your screen, click Q&A and put in whatever questions you may have. Um, with, of course, the caveat being that, you know, I may completely rearrange everything that you say when I ask the question because I tend to do that. So, uh, but if you could please put in your questions in Q&A, we'd greatly appreciate it. And uh, if you do like what we're doing here at the National Council for History Education, we do encourage you to join us. Please go to our website, www.nchepeach.org, and uh, look around, check it out. Uh, we have something very exciting happening on Monday, Monday the 15th. Our website for the National Endowment for Humanities um, Landmarks Grant for next summer goes live. We are so excited to have this. Um, it's called the Space Race on the Space Coast, and it's a uh, exploration of the Space Coast during um, and how the uh, issues, uh, every, everything from uh, politics to international relations to civil rights uh, interacted on, in, on the Space Coast around Cape Canaveral in Florida. So please uh, check that out on Monday. Um, uh, and uh, we sh it should be a fantastic event. We're really looking forward to hosting that next summer. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Joanne. Thank you, everybody, for Oh, actually, let me say one last thing um, that we had. Uh, this is really worth saying. Um, so as you know, we do have a blog and we've been trying to get a uh, little more diverse voices on our blog. And for this month, um, we asked our colleague uh, who has been with NCHE for a very long time, Laura Wakefield, who many of you probably know from your interactions with her through the organization. Um, she wrote about uh, her, for Veterans Day, she wrote about her time um, as a veteran and as a teacher, and it's phenomenal. And so if you do not, if you have not had a chance to check it out, please go to our blog and, and read her thing. It is wonderful and we're so grateful for her contributions. Um, so I, I just want to do that last pitch. Now I'll turn it over to Joanne. Okay, excellent. Okay, um, so as advertised, let me switch this again. I'm always trying to, well, that's not right either, okay. We'll stick with that. Um, okay, so um, as advertised, uh, we are going to be talking about bullying as politics. Um, obviously, this is something I know something about, given that I spent far too many years working on the book that is lurking over my shoulder, which in essence is about bullying as politics. It's about more than that, but the, the undercurrent of that book is Southerners um, and those protecting the institution of slavery using bullying threats uh, and physical actual violence to silence uh, or, or intimidate people into silence or compliance rather than have them try and do anything to attack the institution of slavery. So it's something I thought about for a long time and there's a dynamic to it. So part of what I wanted to talk about today was the what makes bullying work and why it's so effective a political tool. Now, obviously, um, one of the reasons this became a very apparent thing to talk about this week is just that it feels as though um, 
there's like an ongoing stream of really in your face sort of bullying moments going on right now. Um, the, the video that came out, um, the violent video that came out with um, the faces of members of Congress uh, imposed on these any figures, the, the sort of cartoon that it, ha ha ha, isn't it funny? We're stabbing and killing members of Congress. Not funny. Um, so that was in this last week. Um, we've been seeing all along uh, school board meetings with people shouting people down, threatening people down. We, at some point this week in the news was um, information that any Republican who voted for the infrastructure bill, that they're now getting um, threats, death threats, and a variety of other things from Republicans who consider them now traitors because they voted for what they thought they should vote for. Um, so, so it's all over the place, right? Book burning, I think, is also bullying as well. So there's a lot of stuff going on right now. All you can lump it under the category bullying. Um, it, it's an unfortunate word, bullying. And I use it, I suppose, because in the 19th century, it's the word that they used. It, it, and it's unfortunate in two ways. And over the years of my using it, I, I sometimes get two responses to it that I understand, although they're, it's more about the word than the, the fact of the behavior. Um, sometimes I think it, it belittles it because we associate it with school grounds and you know bullies and um, somehow or other we assume that that is something that mean kids do to other kids. Um, whereas what we're talking about is definitely not a, a, a thing that kids do to other kids necessarily. It's something bigger than that. On the other hand, sometimes people have responded to my talking about bullying um, angrily because they think in one way or another um, that I'm claiming that it, it it doesn't matter outside of the political world that I'm talking about. That somehow I'm saying bullying doesn't doesn't matter among school kids and, and particularly people with kids sometimes are um, on the way to being upset in the way that I talk about this. I raised that at the beginning only to say what I'm talking about the word may be similar, the behavior may be similar, but what I'm really talking about here today is um, in the realm of politics, adults, seemingly adults, um, using threats of violence, actual violence, shouting people down, um, carrying around weapons and a variety of other things to physically frighten people into backing down. And we're seeing a lot of that right now. That clearly is, um, and one need not, seemingly need not say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. It's not what happens in a democracy, right? In a democracy, you get to have ideas <laughs> and they don't always agree. And you can vote for bills that your colleagues might not like and you don't get death threats. Um, so what this, that kind of behavior, the kind of bullying I'm talking about here, it's not democratic behavior uh, remotely, um, but I wanna talk about it because the logic behind it, what it, it is, informative, um, it really can show you why it works, why it's a powerful political tool. And in a way, the most significant thing to note about it is that the, the threat of bullying, the real power of bullying is that you don't, you have to be believable in the threat that you might be violent, right? So whatever you're doing as a bully, whatever kind of threat you're wielding, um, the power of that threat is contained in the fact that people need to believe that you or your followers, supporters, friends would be willing to do the, the kind of thing you're threatening that you would do. That's the, the actual power of bullying. However, trickily, you know, and this is something I wrote about in my book, um, you, it has to be believable, but you don't necessarily have to carry that out. And that's the real power of this kind of rhetoric and this kind of um, threat is that you can be, so for example, let's say among my, members of Congress. So I find found in the course of my research, 70 physically violent incidents, mostly in the House and Senate, some within the Capitol, some um, on the streets of Washington when Congress was in session, um, a couple at the Willard Hotel, which seems to have been congressional violence central for, for not fully known reasons, but at any rate. Um, so I did find threats and violence, but most of those threats are being delivered by people who you could believe would carry them through, but they don't need to carry them through. They just need to be believable. That's that's something that, you know, if you can wield that kind of power, you could see how that could be useful politically. You stand up and look threatening. You make some loud noises. 
You show people that you're carrying a weapon. All of these things are things that went on in the 1830s and 40s and 50s. And all of them in one way or another helped to silence some opponents of these, for the most part, Southern, Southern slaveholding folks or their supporters. They only needed to believe that there might be physical violence or that there might be something worse on the way for people to basically just not be willing to stand up and, and face that kind of fire, even if it's just at that point rhetorical fire. That's the power of bullying is the goal of it is, um, and I say this all the time because it sort of weirdly rhymes, so it, it stays in my head, compliance or silence. Um, that's what they want. That's what a bully wants. They want you to shut up and sit down. They want you to back down. They want you to walk away. They don't want to actually carry out, for the most part, the threats that they're tossing off. They just want to intimidate you into shutting up and going away and sitting down and letting them get whatever they want. That's what's behind all of the behavior that we're seeing. I mean, even I, I, I talked about this on social media this past week, the, the book banning. One of the points that I made is this, this sort of book banning and people have been responding to my tweets and saying, you know, well, that's rather silly, right? Because uh, students, uh, even though the books might be removed from school libraries, students are gonna be able to find those books elsewhere. I mean, they're digitized, there's other libraries, their parents can buy them, you know, it's a dumb thing to do. Oh no, because it's not about the books, right? It's about the performance of the threat of you better not be reading those books. It's a, it's a power play. It's a, a show of strength. It's a warning, right? So it, it actually, it's not about the books at all. It's about the threat of the people saying, you better not be reading these books. And we have the power to tell you that you shouldn't be reading these books. And the more people that, you know, not only talk about it, but the, the more that there are school districts that are even discussing it, that's a, that's a threat that has taken on a little bit of a life of its own. Um, it's not about the books. It's about the threat of power of the people who are talking about the books. And that's what's underlying all this behavior, right? If you're in a school board meeting and you're shouting people down and threatening them, or if you're sending death threats to a member of Congress for voting the wrong way, what you're hoping to do is to get people to not be resistant to the things you don't want them to be resistant to. You, you want them to just be so nervous about the state of affairs that they're just not gonna act. And I saw that kind of behavior all over my research when I was working on my last book. Um, and I remember in one case, um, there's a, a very um, sort of aggressive Ohio uh, congressman named Joshua Giddings, very, um, he's physically large guy and very aggressively anti-slavery abolitionist. And he writes in his diary when he gets to Congress, um, and I'm not gonna be able to do his words justice and I didn't have time to look them up, but this is a paraphrase. Um, he says something along the lines of, you know, I'm a little bit stunned at the degree to which our Northern members of Congress are afraid of standing up to these guys. So apparently there, there was a, a Southern Congressman who was claiming, uh, he needed to be repaid for travel uh, as a member of Congress, travel which he hadn't made, <laughs> right? So it's just like, I want some money. And yeah, I was traveling, so reimburse me for my travel. And it's very apparent what this person is doing. And what Giddings writes about in his diary is he's asking for money he doesn't deserve. And the Northerners that I'm talking to here are too afraid of him because he's a dueling man. They're afraid to say anything. And so they're not saying anything. They're just sitting there and being silent and letting this guy ask for and get money that he doesn't deserve. And Giddings is a big guy. So he stands up to these bullies because he actually is quite ready to physically confront them. A very useful person to have on your side in that kind of a moment of time. He's like brave and he's principled and he's big. Um, and he does step forward and say, this isn't right. This guy doesn't deserve this money. And Surprise, nothing happens in that case. This person doesn't like, you know, go out to get him. But what you can see there is precisely what I'm talking about, which is this guy has the reputation for being someone who's willing to duel. And that's all it takes, right? People are like, uh-oh, if I do the wrong thing, if I treat him in a strange way, if he gets angry at me, I might get somehow or other 
trapped into being involved in a duel or I might have to back out of a duel and then I'm gonna look like a coward. One way or another, much better for me to just sit down and shut up and let the moment pass. It doesn't matter that much anyway, right? I mean, it's just a little bit of money and it's the government. You can see the sort of reasoning going on in people's minds, but you could really see how effective that kind of a threat can be broadly, widely, enough so that this brand new congressman, Joshua Giddings, is like, wait a minute, like, why, why is no one standing up? Like, why is no one saying anything? They're afraid. And that's the dynamic, that's the logic behind a lot of what we're seeing now. It's not necessarily that these people, and sure, some of them actually want to be violent, but for the most part, what we're talking about is people who just want their way and want to silence people who are thinking things or wanting to do things that they don't like. That's what it's about. And so, for example, I mean, another way of talking, another mode of bullying we could talk about is all of the fuss about you know critical race theory, however it is it's being defined in that, that particular second to the people who are talking about it, right? It means everything now. It's just an all-purpose phrase that essentially means we don't want anyone to talk about race in any way. We don't want to talk about racism. We don't want to think about slavery. We just don't want people to talk about or think about race. It's inconvenient. We don't like it because we have issues. So that's obviously the threat underneath the, you know, we need to get critical race theory out of our schools, but that is a threat along the lines of what I just suggested that is essentially saying, shut up and don't talk about race. So that even if you're, you know, in a school that, a district that isn't having that kind of a dialogue, if you get some kind of a national level fuss going about that particular issue, it will make people think twice before speaking up or before confronting someone on the topic or just before doing anything related in teaching particularly to race or racism or slavery the fact that there is racism in America and has always been and that we actually need to think about it, that's just an attempt to get us to not talk about it. That's what that is. That's that's bullying, right? And it's effective. I mean, if you're a teacher and no matter how gifted a teacher you are, and I know there are many gifted teachers who are here this morning beaming in and part of this conversation, no matter how gifted you are, no matter how brave you are, and no matter the degree to which you continue right on teaching about what you know as a responsible teacher you need to teach about. Regardless, in the back of your mind, there is an awareness that there are people who are suggesting that they are potentially willing to be violent to shut down that kind of conversation. It might not change your behavior, but if that thought is squirming around in the back of your mind, it's achieved some of what it wants to achieve, right? It's, it's made a conversation that should be just an open conversation that we can have about American history and American society and what works and what doesn't and how we can make things better. It has hedged that in with a threat. And it might not change your behavior, but if you're thinking about it at all, it's already had an impact, which is obviously a depressing thought to have. And it doesn't always necessarily change your behavior, but it charges conversations. It shuts down conversations you might not even know are being shut down simply because people are not being as willing to stand up and say something. So for example, if Joshua Giddings hadn't said in his diary, no one wants to confront this guy who's unfairly asking for money that he doesn't deserve, I would have no way of knowing that. Like the people who are sitting down and shutting up, they're not you know, saying publicly in any way, you know what, I'm not going to say anything because that guy, he's scary. No one says that. And yet there's a whole conversation that my one diary entry shows has been shut down because these guys are scared of the threat that this particular member of Congress carries and that they'd rather let him get undeserved money than stand up to it. So in a sense, that's, you know, when I talk about bullying as politics and the power of bullying, Part of what I'm talking about is the fact that you need to be believable. The threat needs to be believable, but doesn't need to be carried out. And that means that kind of behavior and that kind of talk can have a really sweeping influence beyond its ability to reach. And, and that's part of the power of bullying that, you know, if, if you assume your school board meeting that there are gonna be these people shouting you down, um, you're going to think not only think twice about what you say at a school board meeting, you're going to think twice about being on the school board, 
right? You're going to think twice about whether you stick around in your congressional career or leave. You're going to think twice about running for office on terms that might be unpopular with the people who are frightening and loud and threatening, right? So there are all kinds of avenues and conversations and um, basically democratic maneuvers, ways in which we as a people can talk to each other and discuss things that are problematic, that have a long history of being problematic, and that we can make better if they're out in the open and can be discussed, there are all kinds of ways in which these silences are being imposed and enforced. And, and again, the power of that is we don't necessarily see that. We don't think about it because it's not there. So the bullying in that manner has an impact. It's effective, right? If there's silence surrounding a topic, any added degree of silence surrounding a topic, then there's been some effectiveness on the part of the bullies. Now, as every week I come on here and I, and I talk about something and I talk about, you know, long history in this case, bullying and how um, it was used so that, you know, not unrelated to the present, people wouldn't talk about the problem with slavery. They wouldn't protest against slavery. They wouldn't stand up and object to something that a slaveholder said or one of the supporters of the slaveholder said it was used that way for decades, right? That, that th th there it is, it's powerful. And then I don't have the brilliant solution, right? I don't beam in here every week and say, and thus here's what we should do. But part of the answer, and the reason why I'm addressing this this week. So there are two things I think that are important to think about. Number one is to bring under the same umbrella, all of the things I, I just did that to at the start of this discussion, the book banning, the school board meetings, um, the, the uh, campaign ads for, for members of Congress holding guns, the, all of the behavior that we're seeing now, which is bullying behavior. It's, it's literally just intended, it's like a big fist being waved in your face. That's what we're seeing over and over and over and over again. That's what the, you know, the animated threat, that's all, that's what that was too. It, it, you know, it's like, and here's the other thing about that kind of behavior, particularly in the case of something like that, cartoon, the animation. You do that, and then you say, it was just a joke, right? I'm not really going to kill anybody. I mean, I don't, I'm not waving a sword around. It's a joke. You have no sense of humor. This is just a joke. Okay, so there are several things that are worth noting about that. Number one, no, it isn't. That's not a joke. It's a threat. And whether or not you have a sword and are going to actually go kill someone, if you are tossing around images of you slaughtering your enemies, that's a threat. And if your response to someone saying, you know, I feel that, that that's, that's threatening is to say, well, I'm not gonna really do it. You don't have a sense of humor. That's, that's, you mean to be blunt about it? That's the behavior of the abuser, right? That's what abusers do to their victims. They say something horrible or something nasty or something insulting. And when the person who's being spoken to rightfully objects or says that that's hurtful, the person who throws that out at you says, that's just a joke. You don't have a sense of humor. Thereby essentially doubling the damage of what has just been said, right? Not only have I just said a horrible thing about you, but I also think you have no sense of humor. You don't know how to even deal with this stuff. It's a, it's a, it's a, a thing that an abuser does and I, I, know, I know everyone tosses around the word gaslight, and I guess that's not quite what I'm saying here, but that, that's a way that abusers manage to do damage and deny doing damage at the same time. Look at me, I'm doing this thing. I'm, I'm basically tossing off a threat. And someone says, that's a threat. And you say, oh, it, isn't. it was a joke. It was a silly thing. It's a cartoon. It was a, you know, offhand reference. It, what kind of a sense of humor do you have if you can't even laugh at it? We all know that that, piece of animation is not just a cartoon. We all know that's a threat. Why else do you send that out? You know, and I, I said to someone on social media um, at some point last week where they, they kind of confronted me with that idea, which is, that's not a threat. And I said, okay, so let's say someone at your workplace, um, wherever you are, uh, creates an animated video of him or her uh, with a weapon chasing you around in this cartoon and killing you. Do you feel threatened? Do you go, ha ha, my colleague just posted online a cartoon of him killing me 
ha ha, you feel threatened, right? That's like a normal human reaction. And I think some people are looking at the political situation here and the partisan dimension of it here and forgetting just the sheer human component of it, which is that's clearly a threat. And any of us, if someone in our workplace did that to us, we would feel threatened and we would go to human resources or to our supervisor or something, right? We would take action and say, this person basically is joking about killing me. That's a threat. So that's the, the power of this kind of bullying is it can be invisible. It can be framed as um, a joke or humor or just a passing comment. I wasn't gonna act on it. There are so many ways in which you can mask the power behind that kind of bullying and that gives it even more power, right? It's deniable in one way or another. And yet it can have an extreme amount of power that often people don't want to admit because who wants to acknowledge that they feel bullied? No one wants to be that person, right? I wouldn't like to stand up and say, you know, I'm afraid to teach about X subject now because there are all these people who are threatening violence against anyone who teaches that subject. I don't wanna be the person who stands up and says that, regardless of whether that's true or not. You know, if it's not true, I'm gonna feel very brave about not doing it. And ideally, I hope that it will always not be true. But if I happen to be a person who felt internally really insecure because of the place where I was teaching or working and the people I was teaching or working with or the community that I was in. And if I honestly felt in some way that I was endangering myself for talking about or doing something, you know, I would think about how to do what I thought needed to get done. But the fact that I would have to be thinking about it and processing it and figuring out how to do it and grappling with the fact that there's some kind of a threat there, that's just given me or whoever's in that situation a lot to wrestle with and as soon as that happens, in some way, the bully has won. So I, I talk about this, you know, and, and the great example, the 1850s and 1840s Congress and Southerners doing this consistently and not only being um, victorious in what they were doing, not only being successful in silencing people, but being reelected explicitly to do that because it's so effective. I'm raising it because it's, I, it may seem screamingly apparent, but I don't know if people are focused on the fact right now that we're looking at a campaign of bullying surrounding lots of different issues, many of them race oriented, but still we need to understand that behavior for what it is. We need to know that that cartoon slash piece of animation is not a joke. We need to see that these the, the yelling people down at school board meetings and people saying, well, it's just a bunch of people yelling, who cares? No, these are all in one way or another intended to intimidate people into not offering up resistance. That's what it's about. And in one way or another, if they cause you to think about that, they're having an impact. We, but we need to recognize it for what it is and not sort of slink away and feel like, well, somehow or other, I'm not brave enough for this moment, or I'm oversensitive, or I'm taking them too seriously. You know, confront it for what it is. That's what it is. It's, it's, it's open, in-your-face bullying. And the fact that that has an impact on your thinking doesn't make you weak in any way. It means you're human, and that's precisely what a bully is playing against. I know how people will probably respond if I do this, because that's how people respond. So I will do this thing and get the response I want. So I want to at least expose the moment for what it is, talk about what's happening in this moment, highlight the fact that people in functioning democracies can have conflicting ideas, can disagree on things, can vote in ways that their colleagues don't agree with, can have arguments on school boards, can that there can be healthy dissension, right? There could be healthy argument. There needs to be healthy argument. There needs to be open, healthy competition. This is all fundamentally at the base of democracy. It's about people engaged in regulated, organized, process-driven processes to give people power or take power away from people. It's, it's, something that we understand how it's supposed to work. Everyone agrees on the 
base rules, right? The basic rules of it, how elections are supposed to work, how voting is supposed to work. All of those things are part of a democracy. They're not always functioning perfectly, but that's the basis of it. And if things aren't functioning well, we need to come together and agree that we need to fix them to work better. We're not in a moment where any of that is happening. We're in a moment where people are stripping away belief in our electoral process, um, are stripping down the power and reach of our electoral process, are working hard to eliminate and exclude people from having a, a voice in politics in one way or another. So that's my, I see I'm going over time here, I'm going to stop in a minute, but but that's, that's my overall message here is that um, trying to keep people from voting and trying to silence them from speaking up about things they're upset about. It's the same gesture. It's the same bullying. It's the same moment. And we need to see it for what it is and expose it for what it is and not let it slide under the radar screen because it's a bunch of seemingly random and haphazard moments. It's not. It's a, it's a campaign of one kind or another. It's a, it's a campaign, might not be totally unified, but the sentiment is, and that is to get people who disagree with these people to sit down and shut up. And we should not sit down and shut up, right? We live in a democracy, regardless of how many people are out there trying to prevent that from being the case, we do. And our voices matter. We see all the time, this is something I find like weirdly cheering, right? We see all the time people will pipe up about something um, like in Florida, the um, professors who were going to be told that they couldn't testify as expert witnesses. And then there was a big fuss and then the, the university was like, yeah, okay, we changed our minds. You, we see again and again that sometimes when you voice what you're thinking and enough other people do, there is a response. We're not invisible and we're not voiceless but we just have to remember what we're seeing as an attempt to make us invisible and to make us voiceless and we're not. So that's the larger message of, of what I wanted to, to talk about today. I didn't go as much into history as I wanted to, I guess, because I'm kind of worked up about this this week. Um, but uh, speaking of someone who spent a good number of years writing about this precise dynamic and this precise kind of behavior in the first half of the 19th century, in Congress, with members of Congress, threatening each other, I can say it's not new, it can be effective, and it requires some people to stand up to it. It requires people to expose it for what it is. It requires some people to ridicule it, right? That was one of the tricky things that I saw in the book is that people who were abolitionists who were really being attacked, many of the most effective ones had a comeback, right? So there was like Joshua Giddings who used his strength to be like, oh, really? Really? Okay. You're going to come for me, come for me, because you're going to be sorry. Or um, John Parker Hale uh, of New Hampshire, who um, used humor, right? These Southerners would like get to their feet with their fists clenched, threatening him. And he would make this like one really powerful sort of in your face joke. And the entire Senate would burst into laughter. And then the Southerner would sort of deflate visibly and sit down because his moment had been eliminated. Or John Quincy Adams, abolitionist who used his brilliant, um, first of all, just the fact that he is a former president um, and the son of a founder and elderly. So he's not the sort of guy you can really go and slug. Used that joined with his real brilliant mastery of parliamentary maneuvering, again, to back people who are attacking him into corners so that they would look ridiculous and then they would be the ones forced to sit down. So exposing this for what it is and calling it out, that's important. So that's my, I, I will end this uh, now with, with that call to you, right? To everyone who's here joining in this conversation today to not be silenced and to not sit down and to expose it for what it is, realize it for what it is and remember that you have a voice and that your voice counts and that now is a moment where our voices really need to be heard. Okay, mug, I already saw someone saying, mug. oh, wait, I just saw someone saying mug, 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 okay, mug. So I really struggled a little here this morning because um, a bullying mug, <laughs> it's a bullying mug. So um, I came up with one that it pretty much is bullying in a polite kind of a way. Um, and it was sent to me by someone, and I'm embarrassed to say, I can't remember who sent it to me. So it's a History Matters gift mug. And it says, um, funny, I don't recall asking for your opinion. <laughs> so 
that's kind of a bullying bug, right? I like it. It's, I like it. Well done. Is it? That's that's as close as I could come. To. <laughs> um, and that's a thank you, Beth. So I I see that that I mean it it gets the point across, right? I don't remember asking for your opinion. So okay, but now we have to deal with the mysterious background that people guess, right? Yeah, I have not seen. I've only seen the one guess, which was. Uh very crucible, but it, it's actually not. It's, um, uh, it's if anybody got this, I would be so impressed. Um, you know, perhaps if you were lived in a plain state, you might have gotten this one. Um, this is, it looks like a Robert Duvall movie, actually. That's pretty <laughs> accurate. Uh, this is the first um, Capitol building. This is the, it's all recreated and, you know, it's restored, but this is the actual building. Um, of the territory of Kansas at Fort oh, Scott. Yeah. Yes, Kansas. Ah, yes. Good, uh, good. Got it. Just as I was saying it. Um, and this was inspired by um, governor, their first territorial governor, Andrew Reeder, who um, went, who was dispatched to the state to, um, under the Kansas and the Nebraska Act, to um, uh, try to set up a government so that K Kansas could potentially become a state. Um, and one of the first things that he had to do was sort out whether or not it would be a slave state. Um, and um, he walked right into a quagmire that included a lot of bullying. In fact, um, threats, uh, pro-slavery violence. Bloody Kansas. Yeah, fall, what is it? Uh, da, 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 um, folks from Missouri coming over. Um, you know, uh, stolen elections um, to the point where he eventually was, uh, he was accused of treason in the territory and had to disguise himself as a woodcutter and leave under the cover of darkness so that he was not um, summarily executed by a mob, um, by mob violence. So it's, it's a fascinating story. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, resonates with some stuff that we have seen in the last few years, um, and uh, it is definitely uh, bullying in a very historical sense that I thought would be kind of an interesting side note today. It, it, it's definitely not Cheers or Friends. It's definitely not Cheers or Friends. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it, it was, this one was a hard one. This was a hard one. This, this one, uh, yeah. Um, I, spent, I actually was going to go with Father Cough, Coughlin or Coughlin. Um, who was also sort of a, a bully, and um, but I decided not to give a, a lifelong racist his, um, you know, thank you platform. So excellent, <laughs> good thinking, man. Thank you, thank you. You know, I always do try to do that. All right, folks. Well, we do have nine questions in here. Let's take a look at them and see how we're doing. Again, please put in all the questions because I do. You guys have been amazing with the questions, and it's always uh, wonderful to hear. Um, where you're coming from. Um, let's start with Dale. Uh, in the New Republic era, did politicians bully others, but simply do it in what seemed like a more covert or civil way? When um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I suppose you could say, um, and I don't mean this to be a cop-out answer, but bu bullying is kind of human, <laughs> you know, so it doesn't only have to be um, polit a political strategy, although it is also true that um, there was bullying, but there wasn't in this early period, but it wasn't, there wasn't the assumption as there would come to be in the 1830s or 40s, that it would automatically be, be able to e escalate into being physically violent. So, you know, for example, in 1798, there's um, a really famous brawl between two members of Congress. It's on the cover of my first book, actually, um, in which one member of Congress insults another, you know, one of them ends up gra grabbing um, fireplace tongs and the other one has a cane and they start smacking at each other. It's physically violent, but it stands out because it, because it was that physically violent. So they're, they're bullying each other and insulting each other and trying to shut each other down. But, it, and in part, this is a, ref is a reflection of American society. The United States becomes a much rougher, sort of down and dirtier kind of a place in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, and thus 
politics does that too, and Congress does that too, because it is representative. Um, but yeah, there's always bullying in one way or another. Um, dual threats are just a really handy way, you know, in this early period generally to shut people down is if you hint at people by using some, a few ritualistic words tossed in to a conversation in the right way. Like um, one, a, a near duel that I write about in my most recent book, actually it ends up being a duel. Um, Someone says, accuses a party, actually the Democratic Party of being corrupt and a Democrat stands up and says, we are not corrupt. And the person who makes the initial charge like very dramatically and slowly turns around and faces the person who says we are not corrupt and says, you calling me a liar? <laughs> Bam, right? We're in dueling territory then. And the guy backpedals very quickly. He was like, well, no, that wasn't precisely what I was saying. And very effective, right? No one wants to be that guy in that moment who might get challenged to a duel. Um, so there's all kinds of useful ways to do threats. And duels, that, you know, it's part of people who um, defended dueling as a necessary practice. One of the ways in which they did was to say, you know, if you're afraid that you might get end up either end up in a duel or be humiliated for not being willing to fight one, you're going to be watch your words really carefully. You're going to watch what you say. So look, dueling is a civilizing tool, which I don't really buy that argument, but that was part of the argument, right? Is that if you're afraid, you're going to be more careful. Um, so I, I love this because we had uh, Tom Mackey and uh, Carolee ask virtually the same question within minutes of each other. So, ah, okay. uh, so shout out to both of them. Um, I'm going to read Carolee's because it's a little bit longer. Um, who do you think are the John Quincy Adams, Joshua Giddings, or John Parker Hale of our time? Oh, man. Um, wow. Easy question. Really easy question. Totally. Um, darn good question. I don't. I don't know if I can make a direct line. I mean, I can say that um, Nancy Pelosi appears to be really good at using rules, regulations, and timing uh, in, her, in favor of what she wants to happen. It's not quite John Quincy Adams level of, of you know, parliamentary mastery, but it's the same kind of skill that can seem invisible and might feel as though it's, um, fussy in some way, like we can do this, but you can't do this, but that there's power there. But I don't know if I could say, you know, Joshua Giddings, someone who's like sort of willing to, I mean, that might be a person who we might not love right now. <laughs> because a person who has a lot of strength and is willing to stand up for his or her principles, we don't necessarily have to like the principles they're willing to stand up for. So that I'm not even gonna move in that direction. Let's just say if there are people out there that you can think of who are sort of willing to give physical force to what they believe in, regardless of what you think of what they believe in, be Joshua Giddings. He just happened to be on the side of good, you know, on the side of right. Um, so I don't know, you know, and humor, I don't know who do you think. Do you have someone in mind who is like effectively uses humor to deflate opponents? I'm not sure who that would be. I, I, I mean, there, there are probably, um, you know, 21st century equivalents would be someone who's a real master at um, throwing down uh, a statement that is going to be grabbed by the press, you know, like a like a spiffy kind of one liner uh, that will be grabbed by the press and broadcast everywhere. Like that kind of person has a kind of a power or kind of a clout, regardless of what side they're on. So there, I think there are other ways in which people make power plays of that kind now. But I don't know if I can draw. I'm, I have a very hard time making those kinds of direct links because I get I'm too immersed in the past and I think of all of these ways. Someone once. Um, I'm not even gonna go here. I was gonna say, someone once asked me to a very specific question about um, Trump and, and equating someone in the past with Trump. And I just, I can't do that. Like, I just, I won't go there. I, I, as a historian, it, it makes me laugh and wince at the same time. So I'm just, I'm just not gonna go there. But it's a really good question. Uh, Gloria's question is, was Sumner's speech on the South, on South Carolina a form of bullying? Hmm. Really interesting. Um, 
I suppose you could say in a way. So that's a really interesting question. So Sumner, it, before he gives the, the famous speech that ends up, you know, um, compelling or compelling, inspiring Preston Brooks to cane him. Um, he said in a letter, I can't remember now who it was to, like it's, you know, we need to take these slaveholders on. Now is the time to do it. I'm gonna use whatever is being talked about right now. To do that, we happen to be talking about Kansas. I'm gonna talk about Kansas and I'm gonna take them on. And he does indeed, you know, he, he would write out in full and practice his um, congressional addresses before he gave them. Um, he often would have them like already, you know, in pamphlet form to send out even before he stood up to give them. So he was very practiced about what he did and he was trying really deliberately to be confrontational. Um, now, would he have called that bullying? I suppose, no, although he would have considered it kind of standing up to the Southerners. The Southerners responded by essentially saying, kind of along the lines of some of what I was talking about earlier, you know, if you're gonna talk like that, you better be willing to fight. Because if you're gonna talk like that, someone is gonna confront you. So of course they said it in their sort of 19th century way, like, you know, the damn fool's gonna get himself beat up by another damn fool, I think is what Stephen Douglas says, right? Um, or he's, he's asking to be beaten like a dog, right? He's saying these things that if he were a fighting man, people might think twice about confronting him, but because he isn't, it, it, a lot of Southerners and Southern friendly folk thought, well, he's just asking for beating now by saying that. So he probably intended that literally as, as a confrontation of sorts. Uh, and it took bravery to do that. Um, but because he wasn't the sort of person who would um, either himself or have his friends sort of stand up, you know, he was a person who explicitly never carried weapons and made it clear he wouldn't. It made him vulnerable in a certain kind of a way. Um, so Southerners probably perceived that in some ways as bullying. I mean, that's some of what happens in the um, late 1850s when the anti-slavery Republican party appears and a lot of those men come to Congress and say, we're not like the other Northerners, we're gonna fight. We're fighting Northerners. You haven't had us here before. Mm -hmm. Part of what happens is it scrambles the dynamic of Congress because the Southerners are used to parading around and silencing Northerners. And all of a sudden there are these new Northerners that are like, yeah, we'll try. <laughs> like, it's not gonna work the same way. And, and suddenly, you know, things aren't working the way that they worked before. And, and what you see, I guess, along the lines of my earlier comments are bullies who now are being bullied. And it, it I mean, there's a reason why um, the, the two most violent periods in Congress, one of them is the period surrounding the gag rule debate, which supposedly was going to calm everyone down. It did not do that because you were silencing people. And the other one is these four or five years of the Republicans coming armed, many of them, to Congress and, and ready to fight. And it, it does what you would think it would do. It, it causes physical violence. So um, it's a good part of what's we're thinking about in that question is how do you define bullying? You know, what is bullying? When is it bullying and when is it standing up and being firm about what you believe in? I suppose that partly has to do with how you're aiming your comments. In Sumner's case, he explicitly attacked two or three members of Congress who had been attacking him. So I don't know, you know, um, it's hard. It, it's tempting when you agree with someone to say they're not a bully. And when other people are attacking you to say they are the bullies, it, it's worth being aware of the temptation to do that. Um, but a lot of what is bullying has to do with um, the, it, what your intent is in doing whatever it is that you're doing or saying whatever it is that you're saying. That actually kind of leads into Kathleen's question here. Um, and I know we're running a little bit short on time, but I think it's a good one. Um, uh, she says that uh, you might define uh, the, a threat as a true threat is a statement that is meant to frighten or intimidate one or more specified persons into believing that they may they will be seriously harmed by the speaker or by someone acting at the speaker's behest. Okay, so I, her question though is, how, where is how, how do you enforce that? Where where's the recourse? when it comes to um, acts of that might be construed as bullying um, in a political sense. So in other words, what, what do you do? When yeah, 
yeah there, my question is where is the recourse is what she literally wrote. Recourse to that um i mean it depends right this is one of the interesting things i've always found in fighting fighting <laughs> this is Freudian slip writing about fighting um writing about all of these sort of related issues is so much of it depends on the individuals involved in it the audience who saw whatever happened or is happening that they're so subjective um, that in, in one way, it's hard to have a very specific answer about that. Part of the recourse involves not slinking away in silence, but actually finding a way to publicize what's going on, you know, to, to find a way to say. And of course, you very often kind of like, you know, bullies sometimes are, are solo individual operators, but there are probably people who support them because either out of loyalty or fear. But if you're going to be the person who wants to expose that sort of thing, it's helpful for you to have people who are on your side who are going to stand with you. You know, there's a there's a moment that I wrote about in my last book, but and I suppose um, I suppose you could say it's it's like maybe the most extreme bullying moment that I wrote about. Um, there's um, this is Joshua Giddings, actually, good old Joshua Giddings, who stands up and gives a really aggressive anti-slavery speech. And there's a Louisiana congressman who um, stands up up opposite him and pulls out a gun and holds the gun pointing at Giddings while Giddings is speaking. So Giddings' friends see this and they come and stand alongside him and they have guns. And the Louisiana congressman's allies go and stand by him and they have guns. So what you end up with, it's by, from what I can tell, the most sort of okay corral-ish gun moment in congressional history is you have two sides with, you know, several gun holding people on each side sort of standing there, staring the other folks down. In the end, nothing happens, but that's partly because, you know, it, it, it was the person who was about to be bullied, Giddings, he and his friends essentially did what I think one response to bullying is that can work depending on the situation is, oh, really? Okay, we're here, what are you gonna do? Because sometimes sometimes that's that, you know? Okay. That's sometimes that's all that it is, but again, it's so subjective and it depends so much on the people and audience that it's very hard for me to come down with a, an absolute answer to that kind of a question. Well, actually that it's, you know, after 84 episodes, so every once in a while, we're both on the, like, like everybody's just all on the same page, it's wonderful. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to read this question, but I'm going to suggest that maybe this could be a potential topic in the future, because um, it's one we haven't addressed, but you just touched on it, um, which Greg wanted to, wanted you to talk about the role of openly carrying firearms in the history of bullying in the U.S. history. Um, and I don't know if you wanted to address that now or if you wanted to it, maybe that would be. Repeat, uh, repeat that again. For me. Sure thing. Can you talk about the role of open, openly carrying firearms? in the mm. history of bullying um, in US history. Wow, um, that might be another topic. That might be an interesting topic. I mean, it seems like the most goofy general thing in the world to say. Um, it, you know, it, it always has an impact, even if you're just talking about um, politics and the national stage, um, people know when other people have weapons, mm -hmm. they just do. Um, and even if they're, you know, not some of the people I wrote about in that last book deliberately wore them visibly, you know, sort of like with a swagger um, to make a point, but not everyone did. And that said, people still knew who had a gun. And part of the reason you carried a gun, even if you weren't flaunting it and showing everybody was for that very purpose, right? Because so that's like a subtle form of bullying is yeah, I have a weapon. I came here armed. So now you're going to have to really think about what you do with me or not. So it always has an impact. I was surprised. I, I, I was trying actually related to this very hard in working on that book to get a sense of how many people were armed in Congress at any given moment, which is really hard to do because normally people don't write about it. You know, at one point, someone suggests a gun rack uh, in the coat room of Congress. You walk in and hang up your gun before you go into the chamber. Um, but I finally found one letter. Uh, in which one member of Congress says to another, actually writes to someone, it says he and a friend were in the house trying to figure out 
how many people were armed and they guessed like 70 or 80 people probably had guns, which, right, which is a, a lot, a big number, which I would never have known. But the fact that they can kind of walk around the room and figure out who has them. So the, the, the sort of long slash short answer to this question is, um, it has a big impact, even if the guns are invisible. Um, that's a great topic. That, that I'll think about that, the best way to approach that, because that would be a really interesting one. Um, guns and weapons and um, how they've had, a, how they've shaped um, politics and, and sort of power dynamics in American history. That would be, that'd be a powerful topic. I will, I will think about that. But the, the short answer for now is simply carrying one, even not visibly, um, can have a big impact. I think about that a lot nowadays where they put up a metal detector and there are members of Congress who are objecting to that and want to be able to be armed on the floor, right? And they may never reach for their gun. They may never touch their gun. The fact that they have a gun is a form of bullying. It matters. People know it's there. They always know it's there. So it's, an, it's another kind of example of the, what I was just talking about in today's episode. Yeah, I mean, and it seems like time, place, and manner matters in those situations, right? It's um, especially in the past where the use of firearms is a utility that was used frequently because of the agrarian nature of, of the country, but that's very different than walking into, you know, a place of power such as Congress, right? So yeah, yeah right. definitely worth definitely worth exploring more. Uh, but as long as we are talking about guns, Scott has a question which uh, I don't know that we've ever addressed. Um, regarding dueling, did people practice frequently so they could achieve mastery? Of, of dueling. Did people practice dueling? Um, okay, so a double, a two-part answer. Um, one part is um, most people who were um, potentially engaged in a duel, so in the process of negotiating, um, did not assume necessarily that they would end up on a field shooting. Mm -hmm. So you could be involved in an affair of honor and assume that you were not going to ever have to use a gun. That said, yeah, people practiced. Um, so, you know, um, in the duel uh, that I guess what it's like chapter three, the, the duel that I write about is a whole chapter on it in my most recent book. Um, both parties are practicing um, and, and not practicing really well, actually. So their friends are sort of like, uh oh. <laughs> This might not go well. Um, yeah, people people would practice, you know. But again, the thing about dueling is, it's not about trying to kill your opponent. It's about proving that you're willing to die for your name and your honor and your reputation. So if you're practicing firing, you're not like, ha ha, like now I will gun him down. You know, you're more practicing like, okay, I know I can defend myself. I, I it's a whole thing with with dueling that you you wait to see, you know. Do they fire at the same time? Does someone fire first and then they have to stand there and wait to see what the other person does? There's a lot of sort of psyching out going on too when you're involved in a duel. But yeah, they, they for sure want to know that they can, if they need to, hit the other person. Um, probably walk into a duel feeling a little bit confident that they kind of know what they're doing. You know, a lot of these people are not regularly shooting guns. It's another interesting thing you find as they're practicing. They're like, you know, there's a, one of the people involved in the duel I wrote about is from Kentucky and he's really bad with a gun. And his friends are like, whatever happened to the whole Kentucky rifleman thing? Like, <laughs> aren't Kentucky guys supposed to be really good with rifles? And this guy's like, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm not. But they did. Short answer. Uh, well, <clears throat> this is we're we're just about out of time, but so I'm going to give you the last word and on Tim's question, which is a good way to end it because it it returns to your sort of final plea there during as during your talk, um, and I think it's an important way to end today. So Tim asks, in in terms of leaders hearing our voice, do letters to Congress or the White House still matter? Um, how do we make our voice heard? Is basically what Tim is asking, and I think this is a good good way to return to your sure. Central, central. I, well, I do think letters and phone calls matter. Um, I think being loud with a group of people and making a stink matters. I think getting a conversation going as goofy as it sounds, if you get the public talking about something and people writing about it and people in the press writing about it and petitions going and it appears on social media and it appears to be causing a stink. I think, you know, kind of like with Florida, people who think they're going to get away with something in that case, like, no, you guys can't be expert witnesses because you're testifying in a way that we don't like. Suddenly, you know, in that case, 
the people who were being silenced stepped forward and said, we're being told we're not allowed to do this. Then suddenly the um, uh, board that accredits universities is like, we're gonna investigate this. And the public is pointing their finger at this university and then suddenly they back down. That's a great example of people making a stink. And once it becomes public, people who thought they could do something offensive like that and, and get away with it, don't because people expose it. So that's actually a great example of the sort of thing that I was talking about, which is um, at least being willing to point the finger and say, this is happening here right now and it's not right. And allowing others to step forward and say something loudly and publicly about it. Because I really do think there's a lot, there are a lot of people who are assuming they can get away with that kind of inappropriate stifling or bullying because they think no one will notice. They think they'll just get away with it because you know I'm telling three professors they can't do something. Like who's what? What? Where's that going to go? Mm -hmm. Well, it can go somewhere. It can really go somewhere, and then you're going to have to backpedal quickly. So I, I think in any number of ways, speaking up matters, and it's particularly effective. You know, for better and worse, we now have these forms of media where you know if something gets on a roll, sometimes much for much worse, but it can get a lot of public attention, and in some cases that can accomplish something good by exposing a wrong. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's a, what a great place to end for the day. Um, on behalf of National Council for Short History Education, uh, thanks everybody for coming and I will turn it over to Joanne for final thoughts. Indeed, um, as always, I wanna thank everyone who is here today for joining us in this conversation, for taking part in uh, all of these conversations, which are democracy at work, kind of like, you know, what do we do? What's our recourse? Well speaking up and coming together to have these kinds of conversations, that's one recourse. Um, so thank you as always um, for coming as you have for, oh, I didn't say at the beginning, what, this is like 84th episode, maybe the 84th straight episode, man, oh man. So for 84 weeks, you guys have been here in the mix um, and that matters a lot for a whole bunch of reasons. And today's topic is a great example of one way in which it matters. Um, I hope that you guys will all have a good week, um, safe travels and everything else. Um, for all of those of you who, like me, are getting either vaccinated or boosted, I, I, I wish you good health. I'm, I'm a little nervous, too. I don't know what if I'll have any response to the booster, but I'm giving myself a really quiet day tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, um, thank you for coming. Um, I have no idea what we'll be talking about next week, but I really am kind of fired up this week about this whole bullying issue. Um, I'm going to be on... Um, Ali Velshi on Sunday talking about it. And I was on Joy Reid on Tuesday night talking about it um, because I have very strong feelings about it. So I urge you to think about it too. Uh, and if you have something to say about it, say something about it. Uh, and in the meantime, have a good week. Uh, for those of you who want to stick around, we are now going to have the after party. Uh, and if you are here, have joined us through the NCHE website, all you need to do is stay here. And I have to say it. and poof, this will become the after party. And all that means is we will no longer be recording it. Uh, so we can have a little bit more of a relaxed conversation. If you are joining us through Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and go through the NCHE website. So you need to go to ncheteach.org slash conversations, and you will be able to join in the after party, which will continue for about the next half hour. So I uh, hope to see some of you in, in the after party from Facebook. Otherwise, let us, let us poof our way into the after party. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs>